Hi, this is Kristen Ditchfield Lazo, author of A Family Guide to Narnia. You're listening to Pints with Jack. He was tall, but a little round shouldered, about 35 to 40 years of age, and dressed with that particular kind of shabbiness which marks a member of the intelligentsia on a holiday. He was a philologist and a fellow of a Cambridge college. His name was Ransom. Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 2, Roadhouse, Out of the Silent Planet, Chapter 1. Welcome, everyone, here on Pints with Jack. We're working our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. My name is Matt, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, Andrew and David. This season, we find ourselves among the stars, reading through the first book of C.S. Lewis's science fiction trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. In today's episode, we're going to begin our main book of this season. So whether you read it many times or this is your first time through, don't worry. We're going to be going through it chapter by chapter. We're going to be guiding you through this. It's going to be a lovely journey, and we cannot wait to have some fun banter back and forth uh, (laughs) as we hopefully drop one or two tidbits of knowledge throughout this journey. And uh, before we dive in, though, David, since I know you picked the title of this episode, what's Roadhouse? (laughs) Well, as mentioned in our season's inaugural episode, Lewis doesn't give any chapter names in Out of the Silent Planet. So this season, we're going to be naming each episode after a movie title. And as you say, today's episode is called Roadhouse. It's after the 1989 Patrick Swayze film of the same name. And why Roadhouse? Well, the chapter starts on the road and it ends at a house. (laughs) Hence, Roadhouse. (laughs) This week, we really are being that literal. Don't worry. In chapter one of Paralandra, we'll do Patrick Swayze's ghost. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Well, gentlemen, it's good to be back. (laughs) <laughs> this time it's not near as much of it's not as much of a gap we are recording this back to back days and so you know I, there's still the youthful exuberance that I have but it's just a little different than the first one you know that was yesterday was just great but at least your back is comfortable with the new boom mic and your comfy chair huh oh this is great i mean this setup i'm loving this this is this is just top setup it's great. But anyways. For someone with youthful exu- exuberance, you do spend a lot of time complaining about how much your back hurts. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you what, you deteriorate as a human being after 30. It is sad. Boy. <laughs> Something happens. Speak for yourself. I am in my prime. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's see. What's today? 20 days from now, I will be uh, the 29th of December. I'll be 57 when I was teaching high school, I would tell these young, you know, 14-year-old freshman uh, athletes who could, you know, eat plastic and go out and play a full game that one day they would sneeze and pull a muscle and they just looked at me <laughs> as if I was speaking Martian. Malachandran. Andrew, you're looking great for 57. You've wow. got a lovely head of okay. hair. You're a okay. wise human being. <laughs> it's, it's, it's doing wonders for you. You're in your prime. Yeah, well, I've noticed that the that the uh, description of somebody as young is always a compliment until you put still in front of it. <laughs> um, but one can use that you're still young up until I guess one's in the in their 90s, right? I think you can use it. It's 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 yeah, I mean it's it's a mentality. Yeah. Well, what have you been doing today, David? Well, I've actually just got back in from clearing the snow on our driveway in anticipation for the rest of our household coming back from work. So I was out there early this morning just making a path for everybody's car and I then had to go and do it all again in the afternoon because it's done <laughs> nothing but snow today. Uh, and so because of that, today I'm drinking what we call a milky coffee. You microwave half a cup of milk. You then add some good instant coffee, which does exist. We're using the Dow egg but stuff that we got from England. And then you just top it up with hot water and it is just very comforting. Oh, lovely. Well, um, because you were drinking milky coffee and I think Matt has scotch, I decided to meet you all in the middle. And so I've got my lovely Pints with Jack mug with my last bottle of beer. I've got a Smithix ale. Mm. Um, but because I saw David also maybe uh, 
grabbing a dram, I have a little of my go-to Kalila 12. Mm. What's Matt drinking today? I'm still with the Macallan 12. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 a superior scotch. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, gentlemen, continuing with the inspiration that David has set forth in the first one of cheersing in a different language, we are going to be cheersing in German. The word is... Let me think how to say this, all right. <laughs> He's oh, getting boy. nervous now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. Prost. What do you think? Oh, beautiful. Is that good? Nice. Yeah. Nice. It's a pure guess. <laughs> Prost, I think. Yeah. All right. But first, Andrew, we need uh, the toast to the Patreon supporter, Derek Hale. Well, you know, it's funny. Derek Hale and I have been exchanging some emails. Uh, Derek used to be a guitar player for Rich Mullins, and he's a pastor in Kansas now. And we have some mutual interests, and we're thinking about doing some things together. So to my new friend, Derek Hale, uh, we offer you this toast of health and long life and blessings, especially uh, in the new year. Prost. 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 Oh, there you go. <laughs> David's got the sound effect. <laughs> I don't know if I like that one. To be honest, we need to save Andrews. That was a little aggressive. <laughs> but I do love the drinking sound effect. But anyways, I'm very grateful. This is the part of the section where we would normally be doing an overview. And one of the benefits of being the first person to lead <laughs> chapter one is Matt does not have to do an overview because um, or summary because there is no summary. Thus, we get to move on. So, gentlemen, before we start diving into today's chapter... Is there anything that you want to share? Well, I would like to say that I let the last episode overrun, but my Batesian rigidity is back now in full force, and so <laughs> I'll be keeping a very close eye on the time. So if any of you have anything else you want to share before we start looking at the text, make it brief. <laughs> oh, wow. I think that he's looking at me. So I was actually uh, using Walter Hooper of Blessed Memory. Uh, yesterday was the second anniversary of his passing. But Walter Hooper's C.S. Lewis Companion and Guide, the essential uh, book for any Lewis enthusiast. Andrew, I meant about the book. Yes, and <laughs> reading about the book in the C.S. Lewis Companion and Guide, I turned right to the section on Out of the Silent Planet. Hey, touche, you got me. <laughs> One of the great things about that is in the back, it has reviews of the book. And as Walter mentions, one of the very few who saw what Lewis was doing was the Anglican divine E.L. Maskell, who wrote in Theology in April of 1939, that this is an altogether satisfactory story in which fiction and theology are so skillfully blended that the non-Christian will not realize that he is being instructed until it is too late. It is excellent propaganda and first-rate entertainment. So, cheers to E.L. Mascal, who, Mascal, who, who picked up that there was something else going on that Lewis might be smuggling in some theology. Mm, I like that. Well done. Well, gentlemen, we begin... The book, we begin the chapter on page one, and we meet our protagonist, Elwin Ransom, on a hiking vacation. So after being denied a room at the previous village, he begins to press on towards the next in the faint hope of finding somewhere to spend the night. And, and I wanted to... Be, I just wanted to, I wanted to jump in with just a couple of things. Yeah. When I taught this book in college, uh, one of the assignments was for chapter one, I had my students circle every word that was negative, and they are, there are dozens of them, violent and dark and malediction and crying and irritating and ugly, collided and died. So uh, Lewis is really masterfully setting a tone here. So sorry to interrupt. Well, no, on that, I'm actually glad to do that because on that same vein, strand of thought on just the language he uses, I wanted to actually steal from Dr. Glyer, which you guys are going to hear after this is released, of how she read the beginning part and the, like the poetic nature of the text and how, how just beautiful Lewis writes. And so I actually just want to read a little bit of the beginning and I'm going to read it slowly. The last drops of the thunder shower 
had hardly ceased falling when the pedestrian stuffed his map into his pocket, settled his pack more comfortably on his tired shoulders, and stepped out from the shelter of a large chestnut tree in the middle of the road. A violent yellow sunset was pouring through a rift in the clouds to westward, but straight ahead over the hill, the sky was the color of dark slate. Every tree and blade of grass was dripping, and the road shone like a river. The pedestrian wasted no time on the landscape, but set out at once with a determined stride of a good walker who has lately realized that he will have to walk farther than he intended. I could continue and I could continue and I could continue. But just the way he talked about the road shone like a river, the violent yellow sunsets, the rift in the clouds, like the language he used is very vivid, very descriptive, very powerful. And so that really stuck out to me. And I'm not even a poetry guy. Well, and Lewis is writing kind of a pot boiler. And it's kind of a done thing for academics to kind of on the side write their little novels, write their little books. Uh, yeah, it's, it's I think, not accidental that there's a literary tone to it. Um, and then remember that science fiction was it's just nascent right here. Um, there weren't a lot of science fiction writers um, writing quite seriously. It's still more at the beginning stages. That Lewis was a lifelong fan of science fiction. He read pulpy bad stories and pulpy bad magazines. Um, he really loved science fiction. And so this is him just kind of trying his hand in his off hours and maybe writing something for the Inklings. Also wanted to highlight as we begin to our listeners a couple of things. I'm sure we can put the links in. Um, uh, Arund Smoothie's marvelous Louisiana.nl site has got a page devoted to annotating out of the silent planet. And so there are a lot of references explained. And just today I found the out of the silent planet wiki. And uh, that has got some fun and some great notes there too. But yeah, absolutely a literary effort here. Mm. All right. Well, I want to start with this. What do you guys make of when we're, we're first introduced to Ransom? It's not actually called Ransom. He's called The Pedestrian. And it comes across very intentional and is middle-aged, if you remember from the quote that you probably heard 10, 15 minutes ago, uh, midlife, 35 to 40 years old. Why do you think he's called a pedestrian? Why do you think, would you think there's an intentionality to this? I do. This is Lewis. Everything he does is intentional. <laughs> but I actually think he's doing several things in this introduction because he's introducing us to our protagonist and introducing us to him very gradually initially just calling him the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. uh, he is a pilgrim. He is going on a journey, kind of suggesting that we, the readers, are going to follow him on this journey and in that way come to know more about him. But also in literature, very often when a character goes on a journey, that journey is not only external across geography, but also internal. They are changed by their travels. And I think Lewis might also be hinting at that as well. And sort of when I put all of this together in my mind, I think he's alluding to the beginning of Dante's Divine Comedy. And for those of you who haven't read the work, in it, Dante travels through hell, purgatory, and heaven. But the book begins with him alone in a dark wood, and he describes himself as being at the midpoint of his life. Not entirely dissimilar to a pedestrian. Mm, in a dark wood wandering. Very nice. Yeah. Ooh. Did you fit? Did, was that was that original, or did you do some some reading on that? How'd you pick that up? <laughs> I'm Wait, just did, really Andrew. Smart. Andrew, didn't you? <laughs> I don't know why I have to keep on reminding you guys of this. Andrew, didn't you prep for our conversation with Dr. Glyer uh, and I, read her book uh, or the or the the book she edited that had a whole section on Dante's influence on? Uh, yeah, Lewis's? yeah. You mean the the book that I actually <laughs> you know endorsed and. And edited, and then we held a um, held a symposium with the authors. Yeah, no, thank you for introducing me to my friend Diana. I think that's that's <laughs> yeah. Did you just did you just forget that whole section on Dante where she literally spells this out? Well, no, I uh, Matt, I'm going to suggest busting Andrew over something like this is not a good move. <laughs> There will be retaliation, and it will yeah, be far, we'll be far worse. rolling up our sleeves. But no, I think that that's a, <laughs> that's that's good. Um, also, when I was in the Bodleian this summer, reading C.S. Lewis's unpublished personal letters and notes on things. <laughs> Wait, is there is there a drink sound for my flex? There's some discussion back and forth with the publisher 
um, about Lewis's use of it until he his his non gendered pronouns until he genders um, something. And so, for example, Mister Beaver is it until they know it's Mister Beaver. Um, so they call it the Beaver until it, he's identified as a he. So here, this is what's happening with the pedestrian. I think it's kind of a generic term. I'm not quite sure why he capitalizes. Um, but a generic term for this person until we uh, actually meet him. So, and that's at the end, of course, of paragraph two, when it says his name was Ransom. Although later on, we find out that that's not really the case. And that's problematic in this book. But carry on. Well, the one other thing I'll say about the pedestrian, I didn't think about this until David just mentioned the journey side of it. Reminds me a little bit of... So I, I I was my comment was originally going to be it allows us to put ourselves into there. This is an average individual. You can relate to this person and the 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 worldview that he has in the beginning versus the journey he's about to go on. But also this sort of reminds me of the great divorce mm -hmm. in just a non substantial versus a substantial. Like there's there's the journey is going to lead to him going from a pedestrian, just kind of very mm -hmm. blank, blah, not a lot there, ghost. Mm -hmm. to a substantial individual by the end. So I wonder if there was any of that. Obviously, he hadn't written a great divorce yet, but maybe that same concept is is coming through here a little bit. So maybe we need to be prepped for this journey that is going to come. I do love the way that the text begins with this English hiker waiting for the rain to end. Mm -hmm. As anyone who has done any kind of hiking in England will know, you have to do this quite <laughs> often. And when I first read this after the Camino, it's the pilgrimage across Spain. You walk across it. I got a lot of flashbacks of mm. being soaked to my skin and just pushing ahead, trying to find somewhere to sleep for the night. Well, and David, it mentions he was he was rejected from an inn, and the lady was apparently a British innkeeper of that orthodox school who regard guests as a nuisance. <laughs> <laughs> so, as the resident English person here, uh, are, are they really that inhospitable? I think they certainly have been in history. If if the reports are anything to go by, there are certainly uh, some bed and breakfast owners and hoteliers who seem to really particularly dislike guests. But I, I do wonder if that is a reference to something that maybe happened to the Inklings themselves on one of their walking holidays. Mm. Mm, excellent. Yeah. And they did a fair number of them. Uh, in fact, there's a, a marvelous book called um, C.S. Lewis Images of His World, and it's uh, it came out about 10 years ago in a second edition with nice photos, especially of, and, and text, accompanying text, of a walking tour that the Inklings took. And so Lewis describes it in his diary, and then the photographers went out and actually got the scenes. And so um, Lewis is absolutely an inveterate walker. He and his friends for holiday would very often um, do a walking tour, either train out to somewhere and walk their way back or walk out and train back or you know, do a wide circle. And Matt, I absolutely agree that this is, you can really clearly see some hints, some echoes or influence on, on the great divorce. This kind of shabby town, mm. this nondescript town kind of in the middle of things. And so, yeah, I'm, I am absolutely convinced that that, that echoes uh, later on. That's an original thought, by the way, brain, uh, brain. <laughs> to you, to Matt's brain. <laughs> <laughs> David is having way too much fun with this. You know, I, I think that you, I think it's good that the soundbite is at that great length because you won't be using it all that often. So, oh, don't test me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just <laughs> where I just did you get these from? If you save it for only when Matt makes a really brilliant, I might forget <laughs> where it is. Wait, no, but let's, let's let's keep this moving. Come on, guys. <laughs> That's true. I can attest to that. Actually, no. I think I think this is going to be your season, Matt. Fair enough. Yeah. All right. Final question of this before we move on to the next part. Do you guys think Ransom is modeled after Tolkien? Do you know what Elwin means? Elf friend. Hmm. I do, I do think it's Tolkien, and I do love the fact that Lewis thinking that well, it, he's he works at Oxford, not Cambridge. Utterly different. Nobody would ever guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it is also appropriate given that what we said in the previous episode that the two of them had this 
some people call it a bet, basically an agreement that one was going to write a space travel book and the other one was going to write a time travel book. Mm -hmm. If I'm in agreement to write a competing book with somebody, I'm probably going to stick them in my work. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, and we know that at least in the 1950s, Tolkien was one of the, the board who at Cambridge who created the professorship for him. He was one of the electors for the professorship. So there's certainly a, a connection between Oxford and what they call the other place. <laughs> yeah, I do seem to recall that there was a letter where Tolkien tries to downplay or outright deny the fact that Ransom is him, but I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, one thing I want to say before we leave this section, though, uh, Andrew, you spoke about all of the negative language in this section. I'd also point out that the land is described as desolate and silent. And you see these sorts of words throughout the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and since the book itself is called Out of the Silent Planet, I think Lewis is trying to use these words to trick our brains into starting to feel this, this silence and isolation, even without realizing it. He's absolutely setting a tone here. And when we first read this with my students, once they went through this relatively brief chapter and circled all the words, you could really tell that Lewis is definitely trying to convey a certain sense. Well, this disconnects with what we talked about yesterday, Andrew, or last week, on uh, the medieval cosmos and the relation of where does Earth fit in the medieval cosmos and how are these other planets related to it. And so this is, uh, there's, there's setting a tone of, of we're the silent planet, which I won't say too much more about that because we're going to learn a ton more as the book goes on, particularly in the last chapter we're going to learn, or the last couple, a ton about what this means of why are we the silent planet? How is that related to what are these other planets? If we're silent, what are they like? But there's a lot of intentionality to that. Mm. That will come apparent later. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so Ransom's on this walk and comes across this small cottage where he meets this woman and she has this anxiety uh, because she wants her son, who is working down the street at this other cottage farm type place, uh, to, to, to come home. And she's just nervous because she doesn't really like the people there that are working with him. And he's not home yet. And so she asks Ransom if he'd be willing to go to the house as he's walking past because he's still going down this road looking for shelter. And she says it's going to end up being past that. Uh, and so Ransom agrees to stop by the house on the way uh, and send Harry, is her son's name, back home. And so this is when we're going to get introduced to this this new house that he's going to come across. And it's here is where we get introduced to a few other characters. So this house is called The Rise. And that's where the lady's son, Harry, works. So what, what, do, we, what do we learn about The Rise in this section, guys? Well, we learn that there are two people there. One is called The Professor. We're going to later find out that's Dr. Weston, and another one called The Gentleman from London, whom we're going to find out is Dick Devine. And we also find out that Harry spends the entire day working on the furnace, which is immediately suspicious. A yeah. furnace doesn't take that much loading. So are these two men doing other nefarious things there? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there's certainly a bit of tone. And you also have this kind of, um, uh, I think we were talking before the show, this is uh, yesterday. Uh, this is a romance. Lewis, uh, I think it was Lewis who called them his interplanetary romances. And when we talk about a romance, we mean a romance in the Arthurian sense, not necessarily in the bodice ripper, you know, <laughs> Fabio, you know, love story sense, not the notebook. And a romance is a story that involves a hero crossing a liminal boundary, crossing a threshold, going out to do quests of daring do for a good and high noble purpose, sometimes to, to rescue the innocent um, or to protect a maiden. Um, and as they go further into the forest, oftentimes an Arthurian knight, there's this kind of undressing of them. Sometimes they lose their armor or even their clothes. There's this kind of denuding uh, that goes on in a, in a vulnerability. And the further they get into the, 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 the kind of unsafe, you know, wild world, the more magic seems to happen. Incidentally, in the medieval, um, in the medieval bestiaries, you know, these lists of, of all the beasts, they listed all the beasts, um, that they, that they knew. And they also right alongside listed dragons, um, as part of the beasts. And as 
They began to fill in their maps and explore some of the wild places. The dragons started to fall out of the bestiaries. And so they kind of populated the unknown spaces with these animals that they assumed were there. Same thing happens with sea monsters until, you know, the ocean kind of gets mapped. And so you've got this sense of kind of going into the unknown, that there's going to be an adventure, that he's going to have to be noble and defend somebody's cause. He struggles with it, you know, with Harry, but, um, but there's certainly that there. Yes, we're starting to get a little bit of a picture of mm -hmm. Ransom, and there seems to be some sense of virtue to him that we're seeing. You know, at the end, it says Ransom reassured the woman as well as he could and uh, bowed goodbye uh, after ascertaining that he would find bowed, 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 babe, bowed. <laughs> One of those words. Ascertained that he would find the rise in his left about five minutes. Stiffness had grown upon him while he was standing still and he proceeded slowly and painfully on his way. Like there seems to be, he feels this like duty and obligation as we're going to see as this plays on. Uh, but there also seems to be this fear with him. Like what are you guys making this picture that you're getting of Ransom at this stage? Like there's, there's, there's a hesitancy. There doesn't seem to be a ton of agency yet, which kind of fits with what we talked about earlier of how he doesn't seem super substantial yet, but there is stuff there that's being blown into. Like there is this sense of duty and obligation, but he doesn't quite seem like a truly integrated human yet or formed or there's, there's, a, there's a little both. Hmm. I think ultimately he, he does take the errand, which shows a level of virtue. He has this sense of responsibility and what one should do. Yeah. He actually rather reminds me of a, a young Lewis from Surprised by Joy. But at the same time, it is a bit begrudging. As soon as he is agreeing to go on this errand, this quest, uh, he's immediately starting to regret it. Because he's concerned about himself. He wants a bed for the night and he doesn't have time for this. Actually it reminds me of the silver chair where Jill and Eustace get blinded mm. by the hope of hot baths and warm beds and they don't think a whole lot. Yep. And it's, it's that Scutapian lesson where we're tricked into just thinking about what we want, the sense experience we want immediately mm -hmm. uh, to the expense of everything else. Mm. It's, I was talking about it at the Anselm Society, and I didn't harp on it too much, but when the, the four children, the four Pevensey children, are first introduced to the name Aslan, they don't even know who he is, but when they hear his name, Peter feels more like Peter, and he feels you know brave and, and, and bold. Um, Edmund feels a mysterious horror. Um, when Susan hears the, and I'm always hard on Susan, people, people, uh, <laughs> people you know, get after me about um, how Susan just, I think she's so clueless. <laughs> um, but when she hears the name Aslan, the narrator describes it's as if um, a beautiful smell or a lovely strain of music passed by her. Well, I'll pick up on the passing by. She doesn't ever enter in. Even when she goes to check to see if the wardrobe has a back to it, she doesn't step into the wardrobe. She's noncommittal. But the invitation for her with the name of Aslan, this kind of numinous thing that happens, um, is a sensual invitation. It's to smells. It's to, it's to sounds. And if she'll even follow the sense of these things, um, uh, but I think that, well, we're not talking about Susan here, but there's this, there's certainly this kind of invitation and this, this sense that there's something gloomy. Part of that has to do with the fact that this is the silent planet. Um, and if you read to the end of the book, there's a couple of codas in the back of the book. And Lewis says, or Ransom says, um, yeah, if we could even affect in 1% of our readers a changeover from the conception of space to the conception of heaven, we should have made a beginning. And so space is not empty, as we'll find out soon. Um, it's absolutely populated with angels and all the rest. We are in the silent planet, and there's a shroud kind of, or a veil, uh, anticipating, <laughs> you know, Lewis's best book, <laughs> a veil. Um uh, over the planet. And there's kind of sense of veiledness, the sense of vagueness. It's not at all dissimilar to, uh, to Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad's book. Because in Heart of Darkness, 
Um, the author lies to us on the very first page and he obfuscates and he clouds and there's this fog and this kind of miasma around the action in that book. And I think Lewis is achieving a similar effect. There's this kind of cloudedness of purpose. There's this cloudedness. Um, we later find out that's not really his name. Um, and there's this lots of deception kind of going on and the need to see clearly, which is a huge, huge theme in Lewis. Um, to be unveiled, to see things clearly, um, is part of what Lewis is always about. So there's a lot of that going on here. So if it feels a little veiled in the first couple of chapters, and even if Ransom seems a little veiled, Ransom hasn't quite discovered himself nor his vocation and his purpose, and that veiling is deliberately achieved by Lewis's uh, by Lewis's excellence of narrative. This is on purpose. I love that. I didn't actually think about that. Do you think I'm being paranoid? regarding Miss Alice, because the text says that these two men took over the house after her death. Are we meant to be suspicious about this death? Was it entirely of natural causes? Oh, nice. Nice. Um, well, and why Alice? You mean, why is that her name? Why the name Alice? You know me in names. Well, the most prominent Alice I can think of is Alice in Wonderland. That's what I was thinking. And here are two men that don't want Wonderland. They want science and progress. And also a crossing of a liminal space, an incredible danger, the threat of loss of life, the question as to whether or not um, it was all real. And so I think that Whoa. perhaps it's not, yeah, not at all um, a mistake. This is the stuff that gets missed. I mean, just little point, but then Andrew, the whole point you made right before this too of and in, in, in even connected to the comment I made earlier that I didn't think of until we were talking about this, of the, like the great d divorce going from kind of nothing to something and nothingness to substantialness and that journey. You see that in the language being used and Ransom doesn't have his identity yet. Think of the very last part of mere Christianity, that like last paragraph of it that talks about you got to lose yourself to find yourself. Mm -hmm. I th I'm thinking of Dr. Jerry Root, the reality iconoclast. I mentioned that last week's episode, like – he's he's just not formed yet and reality is going to form him his worldview is there's just so much here of this journey that, that i'm excited to unpack this well the names i think are worth paying attention to and um, i know we were talking before about and david mentioned the letter which sparked me to look it up um here's what tolkien says in a letter to stanley unwin who is his publisher the publisher of the hobbit and so in 1938 um Mr. C.S. Lewis tells me that you have allowed him to submit to you out of the silent planet. I read it, of course, and I have since heard it pass a rather different test, that of being read aloud to our local club, the Inklings. Hmm. Um, it's my interjection, which goes in for reading things short and long aloud. It proved an exciting serial, Tolkien says, and was highly approved. But of course, we are all rather like-minded. It is only by an odd accident that the hero is a philologist, one point in which he resembles me, and has your name. So originally, his name was not Ransom, but Unwin, mm. which is uh, Stanley Un Unwin's name. I was like, I knew I heard that name before. The latter detail could, I'm sure, be altered. I do not believe it has any special significance. And then as we touched on last week, Tolkien goes on to conclude, we originally meant to write an excursionary thriller, a space journey and a time journey, mine, each discovering myth. So Lewis is supposed to be writing a space journey, discovering myth. But the space journey has been finished and the time journey remains owing to my slowness and uncertainty, only a fragment as you know. So, and this is literally the 18th of February. So Lewis probably had it finished the same time that The Hobbit was finished. Mm. So we can think of these two books being written more or less concurrently. And there's some of those name changes that happen. I love it. Well, sorry, I got carried away. You know me. David, we love the carried away. Uh, Andrew, I don't know why I just said David. <laughs> I think I was thinking of David in the back of my mind, staying on me to keep this pace moving forward. Yes, my fault. So, Ransom, going down the road, he's committed to doing this duty for uh, the lady to, to send Harry back. And so, he arrives at the house, which is obscured from the road by trees surrounding the garden. The gate's locked, so he throws his pack over and crawls through the hedge and rings the bell. Now, we also see there's a struggle. As he's attempting to figure out how to get through the hedge, it's not just like a simple pop through. 
And while waiting for an answer, Ransom hears a scuffle in the garden and rushes to investigate. And so the first thing that jumped out to me, and David, this connects to your Screwtapian point you made uh, just a few minutes ago. There was a point when he realized this was this duty that he had accepted was going to be a little bit more challenging than he thought. And there was a desire, I would say, a feeling to maybe eh, just move on. I'm never going to see her again. I'm just going to skip this. And a huge theme of screw tape is disconnecting feeling from action. And I just that just stuck out to me of this doing what he had committed to do despite his body, his feelings, his desires, wanting him to do something different. What do you make of that house? Well, the house does seem a little bit ominous, a little bit suspicious. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem particularly well cared for, the lawn in particular. And we find out that it seems that heavy machines have been moving through it. Again, there's, there's a suggestion that something else is going on here. And as I mentioned before, it continues here, the references to silence and darkness. Mm -hmm. And we hear that the stars come out. Again, a little bit of foreshadowing as to where we might be going later. Uh -huh. uh, yes. So I, I think the house is definitely, it's meant to give you a little bit of a suspicious feeling, a little bit of the creeps mm -hmm. that all may not be well here. Uh, and I would also point out that an owl is mentioned. We're not going to talk about that again this episode, but when we cover the next chapter, this owl will return. Yes, and Lewis often has larks, meadowlarks, or nightingales singing, but almost never owls, and so that's certainly there. Um, if you've read any medieval Arthurian stories, and I keep harping on this, but it I hadn't thought about it until you brought that up, Matt, that this kind of dark house is like a knight errant. And errant, ero, errare, means to wander. So a knight errant is a wandering knight. Mm. An error is when you wander from the path. So a knight errant comes across this kind of big, ominous house or castle and, you know, tries to find some adventure there. And so it's altogether Arthurian. And, of course, because we won't be going over the other two books in the Ransom Trilogy, for years, um, it doesn't hurt for me to spill the beans that Ransom ends up being the Fisher King, which is a prominent figure in Arthurian legend, and even surpasses Arthur. And so there's this Arthurian kind of quest going on. Uh, in the next book, um, Ransom plays almost a, a Galahad kind of role. He's trying to protect the, the Lady of Paralandra, almost like the knight protecting the grail. And so to see this in terms of a knight coming across this ominous house, and then as I mentioned last time, I think that we are always wise to be on the lookout for parallels to books by George MacDonald. Mm -hmm. And you see, certainly see similar things in Fantasties um, and in the Princess and Princess and Curdy books too. So I think there's some of that that's going on with this house. You know, one final thing I'll say that stuck out to me with this house was I, I I keep thinking about the dichotomy, the worldviews that Lewis is is painting in here and Ransom sort of going in a journey from one to the next. You have, as we're going to see as this plays out, you have the worldview of, of Weston and Divine, who we've already mentioned are in this house. I'm not going to unpack all of their worldview because that's going to come later, but... It, there's just a, a using of things for an end. That's just, there are means to an end. And then you'll see later in this book, a beautiful relation to creation with some of the stuff on Malachandra. Mm -hmm. And just, and, and that really stuck out to me even before any of the scholarly works that I read that really did just jump out to me. And so you have this house that could be beautifully kept up, beautifully maintained, Chesterton talks about the home is a wonderful hospitable, even. hospitable. Chesterton thinks the home is like such an important place. And here it's literally desolate rundown. So I, I also thought there was a bit of intentionality there of just the neglect that these people have for anything that could be good uh, for the sake of their worldview. Everything is a means to an end to them, to this bigger thing that they have in mind. Even this house is a means to an end. It doesn't need to be kept up very much. It just has a purpose that's going to serve for them. Well, and Lewis knows a good story. And so he's got a protagonist. Now he's got a conflict. Now he's got a task. Now he's got some danger. You know, he's just writing a good story. 
Well, Ransom discovers this altercation going on between the men. Uh, so you have these two men, Divine and Weston, that are struggling with this third man that he assumes is Harry. And the two, of course, assure Ransom, and there's this back and forth that there's good intent here. Like this person has an issue. We're trying to help him. We're trying to prevent him from going back home until these things are corrected. Uh, and in the in the actual process, he actually discovers that one of them, uh, Divine, went to school with him, the protagonist, mm-hmm. uh, and Ransom's invited into the house and offered a bed. And so that's what leads this next part. But I wanted to start with when Divine recognizes that Ransom is an old colleague. He goes, by Jove. Hmm. And one thing we've learned is Lewis language is very intentional. Mm-hmm. So while that in first reading, when I first read it before Dr. Glyer's book that she edited pointed it out, or no, this was Christiana Hale's book. I just thought by Jove was just an expression. No big deal. Who really cares? Why, why, why did he use by Jove? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was quite a common exclamation in Britain at that time, at least from sure. my reading of this sort of 20th century literature. Sure. So it's the it's a Latin exclamation by Jove, and by Jove comes from pro eovum, rather than jovum because Latin doesn't have a j; it's just got an i. Mm-hmm. And Jove is a reference to the god and the planet Jupiter, mm-hmm. Zeus in the Greek mythology, and you find um, Peter Pevensey, mm-hmm. especially in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, swearing by Jove all the time. This, of course, will harken back to planet Narnia. Jove, of course, is the king of the gods. Zeus is the king of the gods. Jupiter, the king of the gods. And so part of what he's doing by mentioning the stars and by mentioning Jove is he's introducing this kind of sidereal or oven related to the stars, this kind of um, these powers going on um, in the in the heavens. And it should help us to you know, to notice this, our solar system and even space as a populated place. Now, I don't think that he's got the full planets all fully formed in his mind, but certainly by uh, the chapter, The Descent of the Gods in that hideous strength, we see lots and lots of elements that Michael Ward picks up on. And of course, if he writes this in 1927, say, um, sorry, 37, Uh, That's just a couple of years after he wrote the planet's poem. And so Mm. um, Jove is the governing god or planet over all of this stuff. And that's part of what's going on here. Lewis is very, very obliquely, but very deliberately dropping little references that that he'll pick up on later. Well, that was the part that that stuck out to me was exactly what you said the the number one, the kind of governing Mm -hmm. planet. And thus there's a suggestion that this was not some coincidental interaction. Like there was an intentionality and in ordering sure. of why these two came across. You know, you have these two and, and, and that right away tilts your mind to, again, the word that David used earlier of this journey. Mm-hmm. Like there's some sort of cosmic plan that is already starting to play out that we're going to see revealed as the book goes on. And so this this intentional word tilts us towards that. Another thing worth doing, uh, Gustav Holst's uh, Symphony of the Planets is worth listening to. And there is a movement about Jove, um, Jupiter, and there's also a movement about Mars. And uh, the the planet that Ransom's going to is Mars. And Lewis, we know, was listening to this in the 30s and 40s. And so it might be worth getting on your Spotify or going to a CD store and getting a recording of Gustav Holst's The Planets. And maybe David will link um, link those two, the um, the Jove movement and the Mars movement. And these, uh, when I listen to them and think about, uh, especially these science fiction books, there seem to be echoes of, of themes and moods going on. And for young people listening, a CD store is a physical place that your parents <laughs> used to go to to buy music. <laughs> Oh, it's what I buy music on CDs to support the artists because Spotify doesn't pay very well. So Bandcamp, that's what they send out on Bandcamp. Well, gentlemen, so we are first finally introduced to Dr. Wentz Weston and Dick Devine. What do we, what do we learn of them? What's, what do we, what's the picture being painted of these two? 
Well, I actually made a, a profile of these two men to help keep them straight in my head because the first time I read this book, I kept getting the two of them <laughs> confused. They were just like the bad guys. So Dr. Weston is apparently thickly set. He apparently owns the house that they're standing next to. He's certainly more commanding than Ransom, whereas Ransom uh, offers out a little bit of a a peep of objection to the scuffle, he thunders out very clearly and with a real sense of command. And he's kind of grumpy, and he's definitely a scientific, or rather, scientistic snob. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a line in here where he says, I don't care tuppence what school he was at, nor on what unscientific foolery he is at present wasting money that ought to go to research. <laughs> So that's Weston. Oh, I'd also say he is probably the nastiest of the two, maybe. There is an indication that he performed an experiment on their dog. Mm -hmm. um, we don't get any more details. But it is interesting that several decades later, in 1957, uh, there is a dog that is sent up to, well, he's sent up into the heavens. And then, depending upon your theology, he then went to heaven because they never got him back. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, that was Dr. Weston. Dr. Devine, he went to school at Weddenshaw with Ransom. And we find out that Ransom didn't really like him then. Uh, or rather, he was enthralled with him for a little while and then got bored of him very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, he's younger and more slender than Weston. He is probably, you describe him as maybe a cynic. He, he talks about... Uh, Oh, this is where we get a lump in our throats and remember Sunday evening chapel at the DOP, the dear old place. Um, <laughs> and he's definitely a flatterer. It's very, it's very blatant. He uses the exact same formula for praising both Weston and Ransom. Mm -hmm. He says, oh, he's the Weston. You know, the great physicist has Einstein on toast and drinks a pint of Schrodinger's blood for breakfast. And then when he goes to introduce Ransom, he says, he's the Ransom, you know, the great philologist, has Jesperson on toast and drinks a pint. It, it's the same thing. You can tell that he is, he is somebody who is very happy to flatter people to get them to like him. I wonder what the rest of that sentence was, uh, would have been, drinks a pint of Tolkien's blood. <laughs> <laughs> because he was a, a fairly well-known philologist at this point. Um, I think that you need to look at the spelling of the names and Weston, W-E-S-T-O-N, is a perversion of what the true West should be. And I think Lewis picks that up from Tolkien and um, he calls himself the last of the old Western men in 1954. Mm. Um, so some 16 years later. But what West should have been versus the West that um, that, that Weston represents. And then divine is D-E-V-I-N-E. -E. And so that, again, is a perversion of what the divine should be. And so these are guys, these are guys who are twisting the divine mm. or the place of God. And they are twisting what the West um, and all of the humanity uh, of the of the West of Western humane letters uh, and sciences should have been. So I think that we can see in these names purposeful perversions. Well, you know what stuck out to me too was he's entering into this situation, this altercation. That's probably a much better word to use. And he's describing what they're doing to Harry, and of course. Like I mentioned, they're attempting to play it off as they're trying to help him, but we learn to the contrary, that's not the case. What stuck out to me was fitting with this idea of dichotomy between these worldviews. Harry to them is just a means to an end. He's inferior. So there's this idea of superior and inferior, which we didn't talk about this in a Dr. Glyer, but uh, interview, but the book that she talks about, the context of what Lewis was when he was writing this book, 1938, you know, there was Nazism going on. There was a superior Aryan race going on. Sure. And so they used sure. the lesser for the greater. And so I felt like there was a bit of that worldview being communicated here with the relation between the superior individuals and Harry. Sure. Um, I, I think that there's this mistreatment of him that's going on. And mm. of course, vivisection, which is the live, um, the live dissection of animals, dissecting animals while they were alive for scientific reasons. That's all the rage. And Lewis writes an essay about vivisection. And so some of these things mm. kind of come up. Um, we later find out, we'll find out what they want to do with Harry. Um, but 
it suffice it to say that it's not unlike what Uncle Andrew wants to do with the guinea pig when he <laughs> sends him into Charn in The Magician's Nephew. So, yeah, they're certainly willing to use people for their own purposes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see all about that justification later. Well, final question I have is how does, do, how does Ransom respond to this situation? I would say in a very English way. <laughs> uh, the text says he was very much perplexed. Yep. There was something about the whole scene suspicious enough and disagreeable enough to convince him that he had blundered on something criminal. Well, on the other hand, he had all the deep irrational conviction of his age and class that such things could never cross the path of an ordinary person, except in fiction, and could least of all be associated with professors and old schoolfellows. Yeah. Well, and we also find out before too long that, that Ransom is a Christian, and he has this duty to help the poor, um, to help the unfortunate. And so he's not, all, he's not just kind of a, a prototypical modern and uh, modernist knight, kind of occupying the role of a knight at the round table with chivalry and all the rest. Um, and his codes, but he also is a Christian and he, and he owes it to, to do a civil Christian thing. Mm -hmm. um, later on, we'll find, well, we won't find out until Paralandra, but um, in Paralandra, uh, Weston reappears in Venus and Weston um, actually invites demons to take over him. Weston becomes demon possessed. And so we have these kind of spiritual forces going on in some of the conflict and just the very seeds, tiny seeds of those are being laid now. Um, of course, Lewis was interested in the spiritual ramifications of space travel. And that's some of what we see right here at the beginning. And now you've given away a little bit of what happens in Paralandra. We get to see that heavenly and hellish creatures are at play, mm -hmm. that it begins with some of these eugenic minded comments about dehumanizing other people and it ends with demon possession yes <laughs> well gentlemen is is the section the chapter finishes up ransom's brought inside he's offered a drink he's sitting in an armchair anything you would like to add concluding thoughts before we wrap this up uh, just to say next week, we'll talk about what happens to that drink. And it's one of those things that reminds me of, you know, like in Lion, Lutz and Wardrobe, never shut yourself into a wardrobe. Uh, <laughs> when we see um, Weston about to pull the cork, um, it, that just, that reminds me of so many uh, dinner parties that I've been in. And we'll touch on that, of course, next time. And the only thing I'll say is the owl will make a reappearance, maybe. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, guys, as we mentioned last time, we do an audience question. And the question this week is, what would you have done if you were Ransom and encountered this situation? Mm -hmm. So send us an email, contact at pintswithjack.com or just go to pintswithjack.com and go to the contact us section or any of the Pints with Jack social media. And if I can offer a pastoral moment, when you find somebody weaker than you being abused, what would you do? What shall you do? Mm -hmm. um, prepare now to protect the innocent, to protect those less powerful, to protect the abused. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's certainly what Christ would have us do. And Ransom responds, you know, a little half-heartedly, but at least he responds and he pushes his way through and he puts himself at great risk. And maybe this week we can resolve to do that, to protect the undefended. There's, there's enough there in that Screwtapian sense. No, the great Divorcean sense where you can blow life into that little spark that's there. Uh, and we see that with Ransom. Yes. Well, I hear the call for the final drink. So thank you to all of our listeners. We pray for you guys every Tuesday. Here, here. And along with any prayer requests on our Slack channel. We'd like to thank our top tier supporters and all of our Patreon supporters. James, Erica, Marvin, Joelle, Deborah, Amanda, Thomas, Bill, Joanna, Angela, Bud, Shane, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know on social media. It's fun to start the new season. We'd love to hear from you guys. It keeps us, it keeps us invigorated. And let your your friends and your and your fans know on social media. Let us know, sure, but also spread the word. We'd love to have more folks who can benefit from 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 our enjoyment and delight in in moving through Lewis's works. 
Yes, and please join us next time. When we'll be going further up and further in. Prost. 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 Prost.